July 18th, 1996. It's just another summer day in central Wisconsin. The air is thick with humidity, the ground below baking in the sun's rays. It's sunny, with nearly no clouds impeding the bright turquoise sky above. Suddenly, dark, foreboding clouds rush in, ushering the land into an early night. Storms are on the horizon. From above, the clouds begin to whirl. Rain starts to fall as a funnel cloud can be seen descending from the heavens, reaching the ground like a long, spindly finger. Within seconds, the twister matures into a monster, its eyes aimed directly at the town of Oakfield, Wisconsin, and its 1,000 residents. Over the next 30 minutes, a small town will be changed forever. Hundreds of lives will be eternally altered, and history will be made. But first, how did this come to be? How did an ordinary summer day go from sunshine and blue skies to darkness and carnage in the matter of minutes? To answer that question, we must go back to the morning of July 18th. That morning, a low-pressure system was slowly making its way through the upper Midwest. Temperatures across the region were high, and the moisture drawn north from the Gulf of Mexico was plentiful across Wisconsin, leading to high levels of humidity. Clouds were a rare sight, allowing for the surface below to quickly grow unstable. A strong capping inversion, which prevents storms from firing, was present across the state, in turn allowing for the long period of destabilization and the accumulation of plenty of potential energy for storms that was seen that day. Coinciding with this region of moist, unstable air was a pocket of strong wind shear supported of supercell development. It was a classic setup, and it looked like all the conditions were there for an imminent outbreak of severe weather. With this in mind, the SBC elected to put much of Wisconsin, as well as several other neighboring states, into a moderate risk, stating that severe storms were highly likely later that evening. Accordingly, the Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch at 3.33 p.m. Central Daylight Time for most of Wisconsin. Local meteorologists and NWS employees quickly began disseminating this information throughout the forecasted impact area. As the cold front draped southward from the advancing low-pressure system moved into Wisconsin, storms would begin to fire out in front of it as the cap began to break. Once storms broke through the cap, they exploded, within minutes morphing into formidable, violent supercells. One such storm quickly took root in Adams County and steadily began to move to the east-southeast, picking up steam as it did so. As this storm entered Green Lake County, it began to rotate, eventually producing an F1 tornado that would tear through rural areas near the town of Princeton. This was a small taste of what was to come. As the Green Lake County supercell would begin to recycle, another supercell further east would begin to intensify. Shortly after crossing Lake Winnebago, this storm would produce an F2 tornado that would plow through the tiny community of Marytown, injuring one person and significantly damaging several homes. As Marytown was being impacted, the supercell that had previously produced the Green Lake County tornado was re-intensifying, and on the verge of producing another twister as it entered Fond du Lac County. A well-defined mesocyclone would be visible, as locals and storm chasers alike on the ground would look on and wonder at the gray, swirling mass above them. As the storm approached Oakfield, one local would capture the developing storm on home video, catching the moment the tornado touched down on tape. Now starting to rain on us. Okay. I think I've got the whole thing in picture here. There oh goes. Oh my God! I can't believe it. I should swear we could put this on TV tonight. My goodness! Come here, Duncan. Come down here. Come on, Duncan. Okay, Mindy. This tornado funnel cloud that I have on film right now is heading directly for the city of Oldfield, Wisconsin. The twister would begin to rapidly intensify after touching down. After crossing US 151, the twister would impact a few structures along and around Wolf Road, but would remain largely over rural areas. In its crosshairs, though, was a small village of Oakfield. Thanks to new WSR 88D radar technology, the NWS was able to issue a tornado warning for the town over 10 minutes prior to the twister entering city limits. 
The sirens sounded as soon as the warning was issued, but warning was unable to reach everyone in the small rural town. Brett Ryan was a kid at the time, residing in Oakfield, going about his summer day just like any other boy would. He and his family were playing cards, their AC blasting at full power. They were unable to hear the sirens and were completely unaware of the approaching twister until their AC unit fell out of the window. Brett's dad rushed he and the other family members into the basement, just before the tornado impacted their home. The family thankfully survived, though their home was significantly damaged during the twister's rampage. Incidents like these are great reminders that tornado sirens are not the most reliable source for receiving warning before a tornado strikes. Sirens are specifically made to be heard outdoors, and while you may be able to hear them in your own house when everything is quiet, they can easily be blocked out by your TV, washing machine, or even an AC unit. Noel weather radios are often much more reliable and provide an easy way for people to receive notice when dangerous weather is in the area. While the Ryan house avoided complete destruction, others in Oakfield weren't so lucky. Mere blocks away, houses would be leveled, demolished by the F4 winds packed within the tornado's narrow center. Images like this, a church reduced to its foundation, despite the house next to it being practically untouched, were common sights, a testament to the tornado's drill bit like shape as it passed through town. Among the buildings erased by the Twister's winds was the Oakfield Canning Factory. The building was reduced to a mangled mess upon the tornado's passing. Cans from within the structure were scattered all around town. Residents of surrounding communities reported finding cans from the factory miles away for weeks on end. While the damage in Oakfield was certainly catastrophic, the tornado had strengthened yet again as it exited the small Wisconsin town. The twister would reach F5 intensity just east of the community. Here, National Weather Service damaged surveyors would find four homes reduced to bare slabs. Several cars were tossed and thrown considerable distances. The surveyors described them as being turned into airborne missiles. In this area, tall fields of corn nearing their full maturity were reduced to one-inch stubble. Scouring was also noted in the soil, and anything in the tornado's path was obliterated during this stage of its life. After crossing I-41, the tornado finally began to weaken. As it occluded northward, it would narrowly miss a campground before finally roping out less than a mile away from the city of Eden. It was on the ground for over 13 miles, packing winds in excess of 265 miles per hour at its peak. Miraculously, no casualties were recorded, but roughly a dozen injuries were documented, some of which required hospitalization. Roughly 70 structures were destroyed, and over 130 were damaged. The twister caused nearly $40 million in damages. Checks from Oakfield were found over 125 miles to the southeast in Muskegon, Michigan, carried there by the strong upper atmospheric winds. Debris catapulted in the air was also found littering Lake Michigan's waters, a reminder to those on the coast of what transpired just a few miles further inland. The Oakfield tornado is one of the only F5 tornadoes to ever hit a populated area without causing a fatality. In the tornado's wake, hundreds of Oakfield residents were left homeless. Local high schools were converted into shelters for those left without a place to stay, and residents provided their neighbors with food, water, and supplies in their time of need. Despite the tragedy, Oakfield was united as ever. Within months, homes were beginning to be rebuilt. Today, the tornado's path is still evident to those who drive through the rural community. New construction lines the streets where once rebel and destruction laid, it's come a long way since the Twister, and today it stands as one of the best small towns in the region. The town's motto is inspired by the unity and resilience its residents exhibited after the Twister. It reads, Oakfield blown apart, yet sticking together. It is this inspiring tale of rebuilding and resiliency that has given the residents of Oakfield a chance to help other communities when they deal with similar disasters. In the wake of the 2013 Moore tornado, Oakfield residents were some of the first to donate money and supplies to the Twister's victims. Helping them through a disaster, just as Oakfield had done itself over 15 years earlier. The Oakfield tornado was the last F or EF5 Twister to ever strike Wisconsin, and the residents of Oakfield are very thankful for that. 
As we go forward, we can only hope that disasters like what transpired on July 18th, 1996 can be avoided. But when they do happen, count on the residents of Oakfield to be there offering a helping hand. This has been Overcast. Thank you for watching.